What got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Sean Delaney? I'm Sean Delaney, and on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson to talk about his new book, Cosmic Queries to dive deep into some of the interesting things he's explored throughout his career, who he's learned the most from, and so much more. If you're into curiosity, big questions, exploring your own interests, then you guys will love this episode with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your interest. Of course. You're someone I've been very interested in for a number of years. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about interests and curiosities, but I thought a fun place to start would be around a mutual interest of ours, and that's wine. And I would oh. love, I would love to know if you're going to only have one more bottle of wine, what's that going to be? I mean, I'm on death row, and they say instead of asking me what my, what's my last meal, what's my last bottle of wine? What's your last bottle of wine? I, it would have to be. I don't mean to get all sort of obvious about it, but a bottle of 1945 um, Domaine um, uh, 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 Romani Conte Romani Conte. You've got expensive okay, So taste. DRC, Romani yep. Conte, 1945, Burgundy. That might be the single most expensive bottle of wine in the world. So if I'm on death row, that's the bottle you have to have. <laughs> you don't say, oh, bring me the, the MD 2020. No, you, you're going to you, you go all the way. And so now probably the prison doesn't have the budget for that. So if I were a little more realistic, maybe... Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, a 1945, uh, uh, a 1945 Mouton Rothschild. That's a little more accessible. Still expensive, but not as expensive as the first bottle I listed. You're certainly making it easy on the warden there. I, I would love to know, <laughs> you're someone who's explored so much into space. What's your favorite uh, place on the planet? On Earth? Yeah. Um, to visit? I mean, when you say place, you mean like on Let's, Earth's surface? Uh, yeah, I would love to know similar death row scenario, right? Your last <laughs> night, you you got what you got the bottle of DRC. Where, where are you spending that evening? Oh, where would I where would I spend that evening? Oh, that's different. So no, I don't need the Earth is not what would attract me. I would want to spend time with loved ones um, and share the bottle with them. That I want that to be my last memory. Not I always wanted to see the pyramids. Let me go there and then die. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I can put, I guess, in principle, that's the literal meaning of the bucket list. Do the 10 things before you die. I've yet to go to the pyramids, but I've seen really good images of them. I've yet to do that. Uh, I've yet to visit the, the terracotta soldiers in China. That's on my list. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to visit the Aldovu Gorge in, um, in Africa, where Leakey discovered the earliest human remains. I just want to do sort of an African tour of human origins. I want to go to, to um, what's the one that they're pretty soon going to lock down because people are messing with it. Um, the Galapagos Islands. All right. I definitely want to do that. Haven't done that before. And I definitely want to go to Antarctica. And that, that pretty much rounds it out for my travel bucket list. Not, not, not a bad travel bucket list. For Earth's uh, surface. Yeah. Otherwise, I include the moon and Mars. Don't be so narrow minded in the, these questions. I need, I need to expand my mind. And actually, that, that's, that's one of the things you've done for me. I think you've really opened and sparked my curiosity throughout the years. And you, you opened your new book with a line to all those who are both curious and restless in search of our place in the universe. I absolutely love that. I would just love to know why you decided to open the book with that. Oh, because that's who it's for. I mean, this is not a book which is, gee, I want you to know this and I'm going to make you like it. No, this is, oh my gosh. People out there are curious and filled with wonder. And this, let, let me even call it a project, is in the service of their interests. So I'm your servant for the, from page one to the final page of this book. And that's why it's dedicated to that. And I would want that to be everybody, but I know just in practice it isn't. Not everyone is filled with curiosity and wonder, but maybe the book will help stimulate that in others because society ossifies where it is if no one has any curiosity or wonder. It, it's been really great actually reading the book. So I have a, a two and a half year old and a six month year old. And when I put my son, Whoa, two and congratulations. a half year old, oh my gosh. You, yeah, we, uh, we have the, the planetarium going at night. So we sit up, look at the stars and moon and you can just see his curiosity. Uh, so so, so at the, those two ages, those are maximal um, increase of entropy, uh, forces of entropy in your home. 
So the disorder is, uh, they're really good at creating disorder. So it'll be, it's a pain in the ass right now, but you'll look back and say, gee, I remember when they just made a complete mess and they were smiled the whole time. And why did I rapidly clean it up? So yeah, try to stay very open-minded because the mess they make are expressions of their own curiosity. Although as parents, you're not taught to think about it that way. You're taught to think about them making a mess. So for example, they, they crawl into the kitchen, your, your six month old crawls into the kitchen and pulls out the pots and pans under the sink and starts hitting them with a wooden spoon. You, you're probably gonna say, stop that, you're getting the, the pans dirty, you're making a racket. And what you just did then was uh, disrupt experiments in acoustics that your child was conducting. All because you didn't want it to be noisy in your home. If you don't want it to be noisy, then you shouldn't have had kids. <laughs> it's very simple. That, that's certainly one of the lenses uh, I've tried to look through. Uh, my wife's done a great job of that. I'm wondering for you early on though, what, was there someone or something that really just sparked your curiosity that helped lead you down the path you're on? Yeah, so that question has assumptions that you start out life not curious and that somebody then brings that enlightenment to you or opens your eyes to it. But my understanding of what it is to be human tells me differently. It says that as children, we are born curious. So you don't need anybody to spark curiosity. You need people to get out of their way as they express their curiosity. And if you stay out of their way, even through middle school and high school, they may just retain that curiosity and wonder into adulthood. And if they do, we call them scientists. I'm wondering then, if it wasn't so much about unlocking, was there anything because of the constraints society tends to put on people? And I, I've seen this, right? Like the curiosity is almost depleted out of kids as they get older. I'm wondering if there's anything that turbo boosted you and allowed you to continue and feel comfortable down that path? My capacity to express wonder and curiosity was never uh, thwarted. And plus, I've known since age nine that I've liked the universe. Age 11, I had the first word for what one who studies the universe does. They're called astrophysicists. So in a way, I kind of had a fuel tank to pump it. Plus, the universe is so boundless. What happened at age nine? I visited a planet my local planetarium, and they dim the lights, and the stars come out, and it's just this infinitude of wonder. That has no end. Whereas, okay, oh, what's this flower? And you can pluck the parts of it, and you look it up in the book, and then you know the name of everything and what they do and why bees like them. Then you're kind of done. Oh, well, then there are other kinds of flowers. Okay, so you can keep going in principle, but that's a different sphere of knowledge, a, knowledge, a sphere of knowledge that's a different size than the sphere of knowledge that would contain the universe because, in fact, our sphere of knowledge doesn't contain the universe. The universe is bigger than us. So with the boundless, with the limitless uh, boundaries of the universe, uh, there was no chance anyone was going to beat that out of me or distract me. Yeah, I like baseball. I was on, you know, I was in the little league. I, I did very kids things. But when I went home, I opened up the books and that's where I was. So I was a geek kid, basically. I was bigger than the average boy in a class. Uh, uh, I went to public school in New York City, so that's 32 people. Uh, so 16 boys. Out of 16 boys, I'd typically be the second biggest, all right? Uh, I think I was just like a year ahead in growth, maybe, because I'm not that now, right? But back then I was. The reason why I'm saying that is uh, I could be a geek but not be bullied. If I'm bigger than you, you're probably not going to try to bully me. That's that simple. Size matters in, back, back then. Nowadays, bullies are all but outlawed in school. But back then, it never occurred to you to report the bully to the principal. You just kind of lived with, you know, living with bullies. <laughs> Someone should have, should have written that book. So, so I, I was a geek kid, but not at risk of getting beat up by the popular, you know, the quarterback, you know, the football players. I think that's helpful in framing this. I would love to know current day, Neil, though, when, when you come across something that just sparks that, that wonder and you, that curiosity, what does that look like? 
Uh, oh, so I'll tell you what it looks like. Whatever you're doing, everything else stops. I have to explore this further. And you forego social graces. You forego um, personal hygiene. You, you, and you give attention <laughs> to this new problem that you just found. And, and then you get as far as you can and add some more thought to it. And, and uh, if it's really deep, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, send email to experts. Uh, out of the blue, I can do that. You know, we can do that. Many academics, their email is public online in the, in the list of faculty of an institution. And so, yeah, it's, it becomes a distraction. It's almost like the, the stereotype of the dog seeing the squirrel. Squirrel, you know, <laughs> squirrel. It's, so it's very distracting, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Has there been a problem most distracting to you that you just haven't gotten the answer to, but you've spent yeah. the most time thinking about? Yeah, yeah. I wonder whether we as humans are smart enough to not only answer the questions we have posed, are we smart enough to even know what questions we should have posed in the first place? If you ask yourself how many intelligent species there ever was on Earth, and let's define it in such a way so we're the only one, right? A species that has music, poetry, philosophy, and art, and science, okay? Well, that's only us. Whales, however big their brains are, they're not doing vector calculus, all right? I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. So it's only us. Well, we're the, if we're the only intelligent species, who are we to say that that's sufficient intelligence to understand the deepest questions we can pose about the universe? I lose sleep over that. That's the question that keeps me awake. Are we smart enough? Or are we just feeling this each side of the elephant and none of us has any clue what the elephant is or ever will be? Because you're touching the tusk, I'm touching the legs, someone's touching the tail, someone's touching the snout, uh, the, the, the tusk, the, what do you call it? The snout? The trunk. The trunk thank you. <laughs> the trunk. And um, someone watches more National Geographic than I do. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, if that's the case, that's kind of depressing. My only way I dig out of that hole is to say, maybe no one person can figure it out, but you can climb onto the shoulders of those who made an incremental progress. And then you can see a little farther over the fence. And then you stand over the next shoulder. So maybe... The, the sum of our brain power is sufficient. Because if you're gonna solve a new problem, you're not expected to reinvent calculus to do so. Okay, Isaac Newton, uh, Gottfried Leibniz, they're people who came before you who got us there. So that's good. So maybe no one person has to be smart enough, just collectively we need to be. And so that's, that's a question. I'm sorry, it's not the kind of question you were asking for, right? Oh, how, you know, Will we burn up in the sun? Maybe that's what you were more asking for, but that's not what I lose sleep over. No, I'm genuinely curious about what Neil loses sleep over. So for me, <laughs> this is fascinating. You mentioned standing on the shoulders of giants. For you, whose shoulders do you think you've stood on the most? Uh, personally, like in my career? Yeah, so I, when I was a kid... There were educators and scientists working at the Hayden Planetarium, where I'm now director, who the educator had such a way with sentences and storytelling and humor that I said to myself, if I'm ever an educator, that's the kind of educator I want to be. And there was a scientist there who back then was head of the planetarium who had such facility with all of the universe. And I said, I can't imagine ever knowing as much as this person knows. Now, I wasn't thinking at the time, I'm 15, and this person is 40 with a PhD. Um, this is not a fair comparison, all right? But at age 15, I could not imagine knowing as much about the universe as he did. And so, so but I said, if I ever do, that's the kind of mastery that I want. And then I see the likes of Carl Sagan and others who have written books, who have attempted to uh, there's another one, George Gamow, who wrote books that deeply influenced me. And I said, if I ever write books, I want my books to have, be as sensitively written as these, to, to take in the curiosity of the reader. 
such that they will want to move forward in this book and turn the pages and not think of it as a chore. Think about it. We all go to school. Last day of school. School's out! Everybody <laughs> throws their books in the air. And, I'm th and there's even a song by Alice Cooper, right? School's out for summer. School's out forever. It's, a, it's an anthem for people who hate school. And I thought to myself, why do you hate school? Your only job in school is to learn. So here we are, we created a place where learning is not only a chore, you can't wait for it to end. Something's wrong there. We're not doing it right. Learning should be a, a privilege, a, 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 not a privilege. Learning should be uh, <laughs> something you do. You know, you know let's say you go to the, uh, an amusement park. Right, you go to Disneyland. I say, you know, I want to learn something for a change. <laughs> That's going to be my vacation. <laughs> you know, suppose instead of at the end of one of the sporting events, they they don't say, I'm going to go to Disneyland. I say, I want to go to a museum. Yeah. I'm going to take a book out from the library. Right. So our whole attitude towards learning is is I think flawed. I don't have a silver bullet, but I'm making that observation and sharing it with you. Yeah, I, I, I try to be optimistic in this, uh, just, just knowing my curiosities and then raising young children. I even think some of the mediums we have available to us, uh, things like YouTube that, that people can go on and they are pulled towards their curiosities and they can explore that learning further. It, it's one of the things that, that I appreciate about your work. And you mentioned Carl Sagan, the listeners know I'm a fan. We've had Andrianne on and Cosmos. I mean, that just, that's, that's just fun, right? Like, yes, yeah, the gold that. standard of communication. That's correct. And thanks for mentioning Andrianne who is the, the secret sauce of all three cosmoses. Um, she's his widow, and he was so big, bigger than life, it's hard to see others in his life um, that participated in his journey. But she co-wrote the original cosmos, 1980, and the two recent cosmoses, 2014 and 2020. Um, so that's someone who's enlightened, scientifically literate, and knows and can feel the human condition so that when you're communicating science to a public, you do so in a way where the science is not just dangled there, it's, it's, in, it's woven into who and what you are as a thinking human, as thinking and feeling human. That's a whole other way to, to do this. So you ask what's, whose shoulders am I standing on? It's, uh, I, I would say it's the, the educator's name is Fred Hess, um, in, at the Hayden Planetarium. Another one, Mark Chartrand, the head of the planetarium at the time. Carl Sagan, definitely. And, and others who are not alive in my lifetime, but Isaac Newton, um, people who you read their writings, and it's like they were so plugged in that you just, you, you long to be a fraction as plugged into nature as they were on an average day. So this is good. This gives you a sense of, of ambition, I think to accomplish things you mentioned that early ambition and hoping to know half as much and being able to present in such a masterful way it's something that that i admire you for what your presentation everything just seems so flawless and i'm curious though how much goes on behind the scenes how much prep work goes into that final performance that we get to see thanks for asking that and not enough people do ask that and i'm glad you did uh, so let me just give a quick anecdote. I gave a public talk one time in a theater, so there's like thousands of people there. And it's a, I invest my mind, body, soul, all my, any of who's been to them, they'll know what I'm talking about. I'm all in in a public talk. Are you spending your hard earned money on a hard earned night of the week? And you come out and you go to a theater and I'm there on stage and I'm delivering science to you. All right. I don't take it for granted that you have come to hear and embrace what I have to tell you. All right, so there are two kinds of reactions. If I'm successful, there are two kinds of reactions. So one of them is someone would come up to me and say, you are having a good time up there. Oh, you're just a natural. Okay, that's one, one comment. Another one is, you were working hard up there. Now you ask, what are these people's background? Well, the person who said, you're having a good time, that's anything that people do in life but the person who said you were working hard up there to a person to a person they're school teachers school teachers know what i'm doing okay 
the, the sentences, the rhythm, the word selection, the, the, the flow of content. The, so all of this is a huge investment of my time and energy and emotion to get it right and to communicate. And what is right? To, to do, make it better. Right, and who knows what right is, but you can always make something better today than it was yesterday. And so that's what I do. And a little bit of that is revealed in my master class. I did a master class for the master class company. And that's looking at sort of what's under the hood of w before I say anything. And so, yeah, there's a lot there. And thanks for noticing. So, yeah. and, so the, the, the way uh, dancers would say it, it takes a lot of training to make your dance look like it was effortless. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to dance, so I have the, this metaphor is not it, is it, it, it sits deeply within me. I was a performing member of three different dance companies, college troops, not the Bolshoi, but um, nonetheless, uh, the work you put in to make it effortless and smooth, um, you had to have been in those shoes before to know what that is fully. And I, I'm gathering most people have never been, otherwise they wouldn't keep saying, "Oh, you have such a gift." Now, what is a gift? It's something you didn't try for. Somebody handed it to you. They're denying the actual investment of pedagogical time, energy, and thinking that I do behind every sentence I utter. So thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Well, you're the fantastic orator, so I won't try to use any words that are way beyond my uh, my comprehension here. I, I am wondering, though, it, it sounds like when we're speaking about effortless mastery, which just countless hours have to go into, I, I'm wondering the experts... Oh, can, can I add one thing there? The song, Moon River. Yeah. It's, okay. uh, it's one of my favorite songs, my it's, grandparents' it's, wedding and song. It's, yeah. it's so simple, and it's so, it's so uncomplicated, yet so beautiful. And... You look at it on the page, and it's as though the song wrote itself. All right, so now you go to Henry Mancini, I think he was the author of it, and you say, how did you write this? He said, oh, it went through dozens of drafts. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and, and, and he levels with you that, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just dance, and it's not just performance. It's not, it's, if you're, if you're crafting something, it's uh, most things that achieve great heights were not achieved easily. Otherwise, everyone would have achieved those heights. Well, certainly. I'm wondering uh, about that pursuit of mastery. And you're, you're so many levels up now because of the amount of years you've been doing this, the amount of practice that's gone into it. I view this as the experts are playing games inside of games. And as you get better, it's almost the the circles you're operating within, they get smaller and smaller. And you fo focus on these smaller details that someone without that level of mastery would have no idea you do, you're even practicing. I'm wondering at this stage for you, what are those small things that like those marginal differences you're working on that people would have no idea about? I'll get you ready? Yeah. Very excellent. This is one example just to show you the level of attention I'm giving to detail. All right. When I give a public talk, I usually deliver it from slides, okay? And um, it's a PowerPoint presentation, basically, although I, I use Keynote. But basically, there's slides with the occasional video in there. All right. So why would someone come to a theater to watch me give a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> this is, why would anyone subject themselves to this? So each slide has very little content on it and the slide is really a cue for me to talk about that subject because you're coming to hear me you're not coming to watch slides so so what you might not know is that the slides are my outline okay so that's the first point second I'm I'm always asked do I want a clicker for the slides and I say, no, this will be much easier. I say, no, and they say, why? Well, I thought about this. Okay, you ever watching a TED talk? Everyone who gives TED talk, TED talks uses a clicker. 
So what happens? They're talking and there's some image behind them. And then all of a sudden the image changes in mid-sentence. Or even if it's the end of a sentence, they don't say, I'm about to change the slide. They don't say that. The slide just changes. Now, do I keep looking at the person? Or now that you change the slide, do I look at the slide? But are you gesturing and I should pay attention to you? What do I do? Okay. What you have done is dangle the viewer in a no man's land of up until that instant, I'm paying attention to you and I'm looking at your body language and your facial expressions. And all of a sudden you just change the slide. Does that give me permission to look at the slide or should I still be looking at you? I don't know. Okay, now I will choose. I guess I'm gonna look at the slide, but I had to go through that mental exercise to do it. I don't use clickers because then you don't know when I'm about to change the slide. So I have the slideshow going on a podium on the computer and I walk up and down the stage talking about that slide. And then as I approach the computer again, when I get there, I change the slide. And you're trained now without me even telling you to expect that while I'm on stage and the slide is above my head, it's not going to change. There's a certain order to the universe. And only when I go back to the computer will that slide change. And you don't have to even think about that. That's a level of attention I've given to a talk. One other one, it's kind of related. Oh, do you want a lavalier for your talk? No, give me a handheld mic. But we can free up your hands. No, give me a handheld mic. Why? Uh, let me just ask you, have you ever seen a stand-up comedian with a lavalier mic? <laughs> Never. Why? Because the mic can be a prop for something. Okay, you can knock on a door, you know? Okay, you can, it, for me, I've used it as an asteroid. I've used it as a, as a, a, a plum to, to show, I've, it's, a, it's a prop. Maybe for that talk, I won't use it as a prop. But if in my head, in any given instant, I need something, I have it in my hand. And you know what else I can do? I can change the volume of my voice just by adjusting the distance of the mic to my voice. So I can speak without changing the volume of my voice, yet change the volume of my voice. That's another dimension of communication than a lavalier that is fixed five inches from my mouth. And so, that might be completely unrecognized by people. But I do it for that reason. It's another dimension of communication available to me if the moment requires it. Neil, this is fantastic. I think so few people have a lens into, into what it takes to be at a level that, that you're operating at. I'm wondering for you, just looking through, through life in this lens, who else in other domains have you seen this level of focus? that has just encapsulated your attention? Um, so in my talks, which is where there's the greatest sort of performance level, um, I, and in writing too, but when I'm writing, I'm thinking, do I still have your attention? Because I can't see you, right? So there's this mental vision where I'm saying, okay, here's a sentence. Did I lose you? Do I still have you? Do I need to bring you back? Do I know? And I have to make some judgment about that. I, that can only come from me communicating with people in real life. So I have good statistics on your, your ability, to, your likelihood of you responding positively, neutrally, or negatively to some science fact that I share with you. All of this is factored in to every word I put to page. So um, also, I interact I don't want to say heavily, but frequently with my audience. Um, usually people in the first five rows, because I can see them and I, you know, the light spills from stage onto them. And what I have found is if I do that, everyone in the audience sees me through that person's eyes. So I am in a way speaking directly to everyone. And that personalizes that experience for the audience in ways where if I never even reach for the audience, then I'm just there kind of, and there's this gap between us. And the more I can remove that gap, I think the better communicator I become in that exercise. So that being said, who have I admired? Definitely Carl Sagan. Um, I've been to maybe four or five of his public talks 
dating back from when I was 19. And we've seen him on TV, of course, uh, the late Carl Sagan. Back, he's been dead for 24 years now, which sounds crazy. It feels like just yesterday. But to watch his facility with language and with humor and with wit, that combination is quite potent because then you get people to be with you with every sentence you utter because they want to hear the next thing you say. And when that happens, you've opened up a complete two-way communication channel, even though you're the one doing all the talking. They are there in that channel with you doing all the listening. And that's a powerful, potent place to be. It's almost like a, a parallel journey when, when a great author, you're, you're side by side, they're pulling you along and they're, they're helping you evoke thoughts you never thought about. But and you, you think you came to them on your own, the author helped evoke them. You, you mentioned this a minute ago. Are you actually visualizing the listener sitting there while you write the book? Um, I used to need them. <laughs> Here's an example. Um, coming from the academic world where when you're teaching people, it's a classroom of students. When I started doing more television, it was like, how do you expect me to feel the audience if I'm looking at a camera lens? So initially for a couple of years, I drew several smiley faces on a sticky and put that right on the camera um, lens shade. And so when I faced the camera, I'd see these faces and I would imagine them being a real audience. Hmm. But once I did this enough and gave enough public talks, I have a very good sense, I think, a better sense because it's never perfect, a better sense of what someone is thinking as, as I write. And um, that's good because otherwise, you're, like I said, you're not really communicating. You just you might as well just write a wiki page. No one ever felt warmth reading a wiki page. <laughs> they're very informational and they're very, no, I read a wiki page. It was a page turner. Oh my God. No, no one ever said that about a wiki page. And that's not the point. But if you, if someone's going to spend their hard earned money on a book you just wrote, you want to make sure that you, you got them and that they've got you and it's mutual. I love that visual of feeling the warmth. I'm wondering for you then, what do you need to feel to have that pull to say, I'm going to sit down and these thoughts that are going to become a book are going to be worth my time and the listener's time, or I'm uh, sorry, the reader's time if they're. I have to first think or realize that there's some idea that's never really been presented well. Because I, if, if there's something that has been done well, I don't need to do it again. Let someone else do it. All right, let me do what no one else can do. Of course, that's a much smaller section of the Venn diagram. Uh, but if I have an ability or a talent or an interest and I can manifest that in some creative way that no one else has done before, I I'm going to do it. I'm more likely to do it. And so, yeah, I can, I, I have very high, I mean, relative to colleagues, but not relative to average, to people in the street. I, I have high awareness of pop culture and that's because while they're still in the lab I'm out there you know watching Netflix so they have a productivity that I don't in the laboratory but now when it comes to communicating with that very same public I have things to draw upon I can reference famous TV shows and why would that have anything to do with science you don't know that until you hear how they connect all right and so I can make those connections. I, I will, if I'm going to tweet about a movie, I won't, I won't tweet about a movie if the movie hasn't earned at least $100 million in box office revenue. That sounds uh, elitist, you know, money elitist, but no. It's, if not many people saw the movie, then me referencing it falls on completely deaf ears, all right, or blind eyes. Uh, no, I'm gonna, I have to reference something that everybody knows something about. I don't have to, but I choose to. And in that way, I've got you halfway towards me. You're already in, in the, in, we're in the sandbox together. Because you know who Beyonce is. You know what the Pope said last week, because it was in the news. You know what Trump was doing. You know the, the current, you know that we landed on Mars. These are things that are pop culture uh, common knowledge pop culture and this these are my reference points 
So yeah, I invest the time to figure that out. And then I invoke it in my efforts to communicate. Yeah, in, in those efforts, it's it, it's great in, in the new book, Cosmic Queries. I mean, you even have pictures of your tweets throughout there. And oh, it's, yes. even, it, it's fun getting to relive those. So you, you can see, I, I love that thought about playing in the sandbox with them. I, I have to go a little bit further on this because I, I love seeing true master craftsmen, what they're thinking about, what they're working about. Is there anything else in addition to that that you feel has really just helped you connect with your readers or your audience? You have to care how they think and empathize with where they've come from. You have to, you know, if someone says, let me just give an example. Uh, I'm, I, my tap roots are in academia and I was born and raised in New York City. Both places, New York and academia, are bastions of liberal thinking, okay? So, in there I'm saying, well, if I want to know what other people are thinking, I need to find those sources, something that the algorithms of Facebook and YouTube do not do. They keep feeding you down a rabbit hole and you'll have no idea that there are other thoughts that might conflict with what it is you're starting to believe. So I find other thoughts, so I read conservative literature. So I, the books at my bedside are, are odd. I have a book on astrology. I have a book written by, by um, uh, um, Barry Goldwater uh, from the 1950s, where he's, it's called The Conscious of a Conservative. And I wanted to sort of get behind these ways of thinking that are not what I think. Okay. Oh, the astrology is, this is a book that many astrologers read, and there's still astrologers out there. What is influencing them? I want to know that. So these are the books at my bedside. One time, in one of my earlier books, the New York Times said, tell us what books you're reading. Okay. This is a common thing they do with authors. Tell us what other books you're reading. They just want to spread the love. And what's on your book? What's on your bedside? So I gave the list and the reply was, I didn't know you're into astrology or you're into this. And it's like, do you expect me to only read things I agree with? Really? That's not learning. That's sort of stoking a, a, a stovepipe. Never to see, think, or understand what's happening outside of that. So, um... So I'm speaking with my colleagues, and I know how people are thinking in the Southwest, in the South, in rural areas. And uh, I don't agree with all, but I at least know. And there they are saying, why do these people, they're idiots, they're this, and they're, and they're voting for Trump, and they, how could they possibly do that? They're idiots. And meanwhile, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump, okay? That was more people who voted for anyone in the history of the world other than for Biden in that same election. So there's some disconnect going on. Oh my gosh. Okay, you're gonna call half the voters just idiots and they don't know what they're doing. But maybe there's something else happening out there. Have you watched the same TV shows that they do? Have you listened to the music they're listening to? Have you walked the mile? In no, they haven't. They haven't. So what I, I try to understand how people are thinking and what's going on so that I can best identify the receptors that they carry so that when it's time for me to communicate with them, uh, the, the communication links are opened rather than closed. And as you know, most debates today, political debates, religious debates, cultural debates, um, nobody has any open receptors. Anytime you see a show where two people are debating each other, never, unless I missed it, never do the two people say, hey, we actually agree. Or actually, I'm wrong and you're right. Let's go have a beer. That has never happened ever. Well, why not? Uh, is it because they'll never give up what they're thinking? Ever? Well, what kind of brain wiring is that? Well, who are you? Are you that sure? Really? And the good thing about in science, if two scientists are in debate, it'll be on some frontier issue and there's insufficient data, but there's a contract they've signed with each other before they enter the debate. One, either you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong, or we're both wrong. And we know that in advance going into that debate. 
So that means there's a chance that we will resolve the debate in the conversation. And if we don't, we'll say, oh, we need more data. Let's go have a beer. So I, so that's a different universe from the universe that's out there where people wage wars over their belief systems. So I want to know what those belief systems are. Otherwise, I can't, I can't claim to be able to communicate. And that will influence the choices of words I will put in a sentence, for example. So you're saying there's a chance uh, <laughs> and then the, uh, the, the Wharton professor, Adam Granges has a new book, Think Again, and he breaks down these, these different types of preachers, prosecutors, politicians. And then he says the fourth type is the scientists that are open up to exploring the things they don't know and where they might be wrong. For you, do you think this is more about not getting um, limited to your thinking? Um, and getting stuck in your own ways? Or is it more about that exploration and that cross-pollination of ideas between different fields? It's about the absence of curiosity. The day you're no longer curious, you're stuck in whatever it is you believe. But let's say you are a strong believer in things, but you're still curious. So let's say you're Christian, but you're curious. Oh, I wonder what the Buddhists are thinking. Let me go research that. Oh, what are the, um, let's say you're a Protestant, you say, I wonder what the Jehovah's Witnesses are saying. I wonder what the Jews are saying. I wonder what the Muslims are saying. If you're curious, you'll do that. But if you're not curious, you'll, you'll stay in your own worldview and believe that's the only worldview and that anyone else who doesn't share it is either wrong, deluded, or dangerous. So just speaking of curiosity, I've got something I've wanted to ask you for a while. So, so don't you know when- Well, wait, just to put a tie a bow on that, if you're curious, you will never become ossified in your thinking because curiosity is a pathway out of the staleness of what it is you thought was true. An infinite game in a sense. It can be. Do you view it as your, for yourself as an infinite game? Um, well, I'm sorry, you said infinite game? Correct. Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's, as long as there's something you don't know and you're curious, you're going to want to find out. Um, so just to make it clear, I, on my shelf, um, I, I'm occasionally attacked by UFO people because they, they want me to just believe that what they see in the sky that they don't understand is actually visiting aliens. And I just say, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. Here, here's something. I, I, am, I haven't checked, but if you're a betting person, bet with me on this, all right? that I own more books on UFO sightings than they own on skepticism. Hmm. Okay? If a religious person said, God had to have been there to start the universe, I bet I own more religious texts than you own books on physics and astronomy. Okay? Because that's my bedside habit. As I said, I want to know what everyone else is thinking. And so, uh, so, so yeah, that's, 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 that's what's under the hood. And, and you can carry it to your grave. The curiosity of exploring that which you don't understand. And the curiosity is, I want to understand it, or at least I want to know more about it, even if I don't end up understanding it. What oh, by the way, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Give you an example. Um, in, 19, in 2016, when Trump was, was, they were still running for president, and he was still running for president, and all these revelations about him were coming out, and everyone assumed that that would be the end of Trump, and it wasn't. He just kept moving. So CNN, they were somewhere in some rural place. There's a woman, like, right off the farm, and they say, who are you going to vote for? And she said, oh, Donald Trump, of course. This is right after you heard about his misogynistic conduct and, and this is a woman and so they asked well didn't you don't you realize what else he's done and his attitudes towards women and her response was yeah he's an idiot but at least he's our idiot <laughs> it was like okay now, now i understand <laughs> okay there's no come there's no come back to that all right i, I I'm, I'm so glad i witnessed that because it was like all right Okay, let's go have a beer because I can't I can't argue you out of that one. All right. <laughs> I know there might be pathways there, but I'm just saying I'd like seeing and knowing how people 
come arrive at decisions. It's highly, highly helpful to me. Was there a decision that you wrestled with for the longest period of time that you finally changed your view on? The wrestling part would be more internal. And for me, it's just a matter of data. If the data are sufficient, you just go with the data. It's not, a, it's not about wrestling. It's not, oh my gosh, I have to unthink it. No, is the data, it's data. You embrace it and move on. It's not. <clears throat> um, the way you posed the question, it was as though I had deep emotional investment in belief systems that I was reluctant to relinquish in the face of new data. But if I'm always just following the best available data, then you know that's kind of almost always in motion and you can't rest on that. There's no time or room to put your emotions in the, uh, to, to emotionally commit to one idea or, or another. To me, the ideas have no emotional connection. They're just ideas. And so, uh, yeah, you have a better idea. I'm all, I'm all for it. And it works and it makes sense and it's the data support it. Let's do it. Neil, thanks for reshaping that. That was really helpful. Uh, and the importance of questions. And if it's, it's shaped wrong, we're, we're going to get the answer. We're not, we're, we will never know. So I, I appreciate that. One thing I would love to know, and, and we're going to dive into some of the cosmic queries here in a second. I know we've got to wrap up shortly. Mm -hmm. but when you're thinking of someone you haven't talked to in years, and then all of a sudden they call you or you see them, what is that called? And how do you think that through? Um, all right. Uh, the human sensory system, I'm going to give you a bigger answer than you're bargaining for here. No, please. <laughs> the human sensory system is fraught with inaccuracies. In fact, science did not establish taproot into our moving frontier of discovery until we were able to invent machines, tools to supplant our senses so that we were no longer susceptible to what your brain, eye, ear um, system would be delivering about reality. So one of the things that we are wholly inadequate, wholly incapable, I think even genetically as humans, of, of having an intuition about is probability and statistics. We just, and in fact, Las Vegas exploits this fact about humans. All right, you're at the roulette table and, oh, a seven hasn't come up in a long time. We're due for a seven. That is not how probability works. <laughs> Sorry. But you can't tell that to the person who's betting because they're, the lens through which they see the world is blended with the frailties of our understanding of the world that is not our fault. We have a brain designed to not get eaten by lions on the Serengeti, okay? It's not to develop sophisticated statistical tools to understand our environment. So, uh, I'll get to your specific question in a minute. In the old, people don't say this anymore, I think because of the internet, but you could be visiting, this is the same scenario, but recast as the, your, your telephone example. You're visiting a city, city you've never been in before, and then you meet an old friend there. And so then what's your first phrase to them? It's small world, okay? You don't hear that much, but that was a very common expression. You meet someone in a foreign land that you know, small world, small world, what are you doing? Small world, what are the odds? What are the odds, what are the chances? Okay, um, next time, why not do this? Uh, go up to everyone in the street, one by one. Have them line up who would otherwise have passed you in the street, but you make them line up and say, do I know you? No, yeah, I don't know you either. Big world, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and just do that. You will do that tens of thousands of times, thereby collecting data on how big the world actually is. And then you run the numbers. How many people do you know in life? Okay, scatter them around. Now you meet 10,000 people who you didn't say big world, but you could have. And what are the chances that someone would, that you know would be in that group? Very high. In fact, 
it would be a day where there isn't an odd coincidence that would be odd mm. because we have no way uh, so that's why the methods and tools of mathematics statistics is one of the latest branches of math to be de to be developed it wasn't until like the 16 1700s and early 1800s only then was statistics by the way before then we had calculus we had geometry we had all these other branches but statistics came late and i think it's because it does not emanate naturally from our thinking so yeah you want to believe you're special in this universe so these things that look like oh a coincidence no there's no such thing as coincidences it's all preordained you need to take a statistics class yeah, unfortunately, my mom's going to find out in the conversation, Sean, you're just not special. So, so thanks, thanks, thanks for shaping that one. <laughs> yeah, just think about it. It's really the urge to think you're special yeah. in a world. And I, I can't fault people for that. It feels good to be special. Uh, the religion provides that, especially, you know, Christianity. Jesus is with me, right? I feel special. Even when everything else is going wrong and everybody hates me, Jesus loves me. So that's... so. Jesus, the son of God, creator of the universe, loves me. So that gives you a special place, and it's good for your psychology, your emotion. I don't have a problem with that. But just don't, at the end of the day, assert that you can still think that. But if you want to come out and start telling others that you are special for those reasons, it'll be subject to an objective analysis, and it will show that it's the pure statistics of the moment. Yeah, very good point right there. I know we're going to close up here shortly. I would love to get just a, a little bit here on the multiverse. And I, I know you, you write about it. There's a whole book. chapter on that. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. I was rereading re it this morning. Uh, I would just love to hear you, just you talk for a minute just so the listeners can get a preview of this. Yeah, the multiverse, if people hear me chewing, it's because I was, um, I'm eating lunch during this interview. So <laughs> sorry. I'm actually eating cubes of, Edom, of aged Edom cheese. Um, but anyhow, the, the multiverse is, we, we didn't just pull it out of the ether. Following the math and the physics of quantum physics and relativity, the multiverse comes naturally out of those equations and in the inflationary scenario of the universe. It flows out. We were forced to have to think about a multiverse. And it's, a, it's recent, you know, in the last few decades. And... It turns out there are different levels of multiverse. The one we're probably all familiar with, talked about in movies, is another universe, there may be an infinite number of them, and the laws of physics are all the same. In fact, it just looks like another one of our universes. That's one level of multiverse. Another one is, the laws of physics are the same, but the initial conditions are different. The mixture of matter and energy might be different, and dark energy and dark matter. So that universe could have many more planets or fewer planets if it had different initial conditions. Another level of multiverse is one where the very laws of physics are different. That would be really dangerous to visit because if the charge on the electron is slightly different, you step across that portal, you could decompose into a pile of goo in that instance. So you wanna avoid those universes if you can. Um, and imagine a universe that has no laws of physics in it at all. What would that be like? What, what does it even mean to pose that question? So in Cosmic Queries, which is really a celebration of curiosity and, and questioning, we, the multiverse is an excellent example of questions that we can answer, questions that we think we can answer, and questions we don't even know if it's the right question. And there I, you have it. I love it. Yeah. Cosmic Queries, uh, it, it's the book. It, it explores so many interesting, fascinating topics, and, and like you mentioned, really does pull at your curiosity, uh, which is which is why I love this so much. Um, I, I would love to just hear your, your final thoughts in the book. Any anything else that that you're hoping you pull the listeners along with uh, in their journey with this book? Yeah, I think the book is um, it's got very deep things in it. It's not like I said; it's not just wiki answers to wiki style questions. They're questions that have philosophical implications religious and spiritual implications and because there are the deepest questions we have ever asked as a species how did it all happen how do we get to be this way how where how will it all end and so the book is a, is a is a gift from me to all of those who lay awake at night 
contemplating the deepest questions humans have ever asked. I love it. Neil deGrasse Tyson, this has been such a pleasure for me, a, a true honor. One final one here as we wrap up. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've mentioned a lot of people. If you were going to get to spend an evening having a great long conversation like this with someone dead or alive, just not a family member or a friend, who would you love having a conversation with for hours one evening? Yeah, I, so I thought about that. I think about that often. And my first choice would be Isaac Newton, just because he was so plugged into the universe. But then I realized that would be an awkward conversation. He would say, like, well, how'd you get here? I would say, well, I drove. What did you drive? Well, a car. What's a car? Oh, it's a horse-drawn carriage without a horse. Well, then how does it move? It has an engine. Well, what's an engine? Well, it works on pistons and gas. What's gas? Well, it's chemical energy. What's chemical energy? Because chemistry was not yet developed. And I'd be spending the whole dinner catching him up on stuff that's relevant. And so I thought um, I've had to bring someone from a more recent time and maybe Marie Curie. Okay, I mean, within the you know last centuries, um, Marie Curie, someone who's curious, who knows enough about science of modern times so that I can catch her up much more easily than Isaac Newton. Um, certainly Einstein would, would be a fast study. And I wouldn't want politicians. I don't care. I don't think uh, I'm not interested in politicians. I want interested in thinkers who help shape the science and technology of the civilization that today we all take for granted. Well, Neil, thank you for helping shape our thinking and allowing people to understand that, that curiosity can be a superpower. So thanks so much. This is <laughs> I like that. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for having me.